Hello and good evening. Welcome along. This is Live Irish Myths. I'm Anthony Murphy with Mythical Ireland. You're very welcome to Chach Waraku on this lovely sunny Boyne Valley evening. The sun is shining in the window here. Summer is still with us, although it did a lot of rain overnight. Hope everybody is keeping safe and well. Tonight, we are talking about Poin Bo Freich again, the second part of the story. I hope you enjoyed last week's episode. I certainly did. And this is a story that contains a lot of very interesting elements and uh, is, uh, I think, uh, quite fascinating. On YouTube tonight, <laughs> the YouTubers get in early with the comments, you see, because I have to set up the YouTube feed early. Daisy Peters who is uh, one of the uh, regular commenters on, on YouTube, says, A very beautiful Monday, Anthony, and my dearest two of the Mythflix, I'm looking forward to the second episode. Here we go. Welcome along, Daisy. Mandy McCurl says, Hello, everyone from Dull and Damp Isle of Mull. Sounds like the weather that we had this morning is still with you, Mandy. So delighted to be here with the two of the Mythflix. Tearing myself away from mystery train on Orty Lyric. No hope for me. Actually, you might have seen the radio. I'm not sure if you can see the radio there in the corner. I, I'm a big, big Lyric FM read, uh, listener. Uh, Deborah Williams says, hello, everyone. This is the first time I've been able to catch. Very excited. Well, welcome along, Deborah. Thank you for joining us on Live Irish Mits. It's great to have you along. Zoe's Magic Kingdom says, yay, I've been w w wanting to catch this live since he started. Well, there you go. There's two people on YouTube who haven't seen us live before. Brilliant stuff. Uh, Zoe, uh, I take it. Uh, you're very welcome. Archaeoastronomy Database says, hi, Anthony and friends. I am simply over the moon to be here with you all. <laughs> First quarter moon as well. Uh, very good to have you along. And no astronomical pun intended. Uh, the full Irish GK says, Falsha, good evening all. A wild day on the sod. Yes. We've had all sorts of weather today, typical Irish day, but welcome along. Judith Nyland is in the house. Hello, dear friend. Mm -hmm. Pure delight to be with you today. I hope you are safe and well, Judith. Great to see you uh, and looking forward to seeing you next time you are back uh, on the old side. Jackie Stevenson says hello, Anthony, and the wonderful tour. I've missed everyone. Ready for another great episode. I didn't cheat and look ahead. <laughs> Good stuff, Jackie. Flower Child is also in the house, says Falcha, everyone. Welcome along. Banachti. Uh, Lillian Cruz says, congrats on your library. Thank you, Lillian. Uh, recently upgraded and uh, a, a much more tidy scenario. Uh, easier to get to stuff now, so it's great. Michael O'Leary says, oh boy, a new video. Can't wait to see what's in store. Welcome along, Michael. And I presume that's not the Michael O'Leary who is uh, the former or the current chief executive of Ryanair. <laughs> Erica Bow says, good afternoon. Hello, Erica. Nice to see you. Uh, to have you along in the house as always Stephen Walker says cheers everyone slaunch you good evening and on Facebook oh and here we go Patricia McIntyre says hello Falchie Patricia Desiree Riley is in the house hello Desiree Vicky Wallace Southern says hello my lovely friends miss my tribe well we're here we're here just not so often and if uh, Evan is with you hello to Evan as well good evening to you both Burr Whelan says hi Anthony hi everyone welcome along Burr Falchie Desiree says, hello, Anthony, and all the two are happy to be here. And as always, we're happy to have you here. Judy McQueen says, hello, Gia Gooch. Uh, sorry, I missed one there. Steve Martinson says, hello, Anthony, and all the Mythflix clan. Be safe and be well. And the same to you, Steve. Barbara Barney says, hi, Anthony, and hi, everyone. Falls you. Kristen Gray Tigert says, hi, Anthony, hi, Tua. Good to see everyone. And yes, likewise, good to see you all. Denise Murphy says, hi from Connecticut. And as I'm always saying, it is a great pleasure to have another Murphy in the Murphy household. Hang on till I just make a tiny adjustment to the uh, camera. Uh, Megan Walters says, hi, everyone. Gia Gutsch, Megan. Paul Nethercott says, hi, Anthony. How are you? Paul, I, I, I know you emailed me I'm, and I apologize. I have been tremendously busy, which I will explain in a couple of minutes. Uh, but I haven't forgotten about you. How are you? Susan Scott says, hello, hot and sunny here in Connecticut. Nearly 100 degrees, but so good to be with all the two of this afternoon. Hello, Susan. Welcome along. Aaron Durrett is watching. Hello, Aaron. Jennifer Foley says, hello, everyone. Gia Gutsch. Jim Conway is in the house. Fall to Jim. Welcome along. Nick, Nick Eska Casterton says, it's been pouring down all day, but as soon as Netflix is on, the sun came out. It's a miracle. <laughs> hello to the mighty Tua. Hello, Nick. Alwyn Roy Badziak says, hello, Anthony, and friendly Tua. Ready for part two of the story. Emphasis on friendly. Yes, absolutely. We all need it right now, don't we? It's nice to have uh, these uh, 
friendships. Barbara Kling says, hello, Anthony and the two are from Vermont. Falsha, Barbara, welcome from uh, Drahada to Vermont. Theresa McGuinness says, greetings from, it says Jax, J-A-X, Jax, Florida. Is it Jacksonville? Uh, Theresa, it's great to have you along. Mariana Dunn says, greetings, dear Tua and Anthony from Virginia. So happy to be joining this Mythflix episode. Falsha, Mariana. Philomena Breen says, hello, Anthony, wishing you well. And the same right back to you, Philomena. A good evening to you. Movanway Millward says, evening, dear Tua and Anthony from Mid Wales. I've just been for a lovely evening walk by the river, bursting its banks after the rain here, but sunshine now. Yes, indeed. Uh, four seasons in one day. Mavanway, you're very welcome along. Paul says, really enjoyed your comet photos. Well, I have to say, I really enjoyed taking them, except for the fact that a couple of mornings I didn't get to bed till four o'clock and five o'clock and missed sleep and all that. But it was worth it, definitely. Freya Stjohom says, Tranonawa Anton and the marvellous Tua. Falcha Freya. Margaret Ring is in the house. That's good evening, Anthony, and all the lovely Tua. Margaret, I need, I'm going to have to keep those things clean behind me, you know, plenty of dusting. Doris O'Hara says, hello, Anthony, and everyone. Falcha Doris. Aaron Durrett, hi and welcome, Deborah. Please go and check out the Mythical Ireland community on Facebook. Good to have you. Yes, indeed. Don't forget to check out the Mythical Ireland community, which is a different page to the Mythical Ireland page. Patricia Langton is in the house. Hello, Patricia. Ralph Waldron says, Almanac of Ireland, 10.30 Wednesday, Radio RTE. Good stuff, Ralph. We'll listen in to that. Ralph Shrigley Wolf says, watching from Wales. Falls you, uh, Robert. Uh, I could shout out the window at you and you might hear me across the sea there. Yvette Tillema says, hi all, missed you, promise I didn't go read part two, genius story. Yes, uh, that's okay, you can read it, um, but um, yeah, let, let's, let's, let's get some insights as well and see what people have to say. Brendan Byrne says, banished to the attic, but with good company. <laughs> I wonder, what is it? who or what is the good company? Evan and his whale are watching. Hello Evan, how are you? Good evening, Falcha. Bethany Cutler says, hello to her from Maine, back to Idaho next week. Wow, good stuff. And hello to Maine from us to you. Barbara Murphy, another Murphy in the house, says hello from Tucson. I love the library, but hope a few of the non-book goodies reappear. And after have to have a chat with the wife about it. <laughs> Joe Butler says, greetings from Colorado. So happy the Tua is gathered again, as I am in uh, also, Joe. Tom King says, hello, Anthony, all the mighty Tua. That week just flew by. Yeah, it's really, the time is flying. We're nearly into Lunasa. Hope everyone's in good form. Dram topped up, forge lit, and it's story time. Just wonderful, brilliant stuff, Tom. Really enjoyed your artwork uh, for Margaret. Absolutely fabulous piece of work. Martin Doyle says, namaste. Falcha, Martin, a good evening to you. Tranonawa. Aaron says, hi there, dear Anthony and Tua, from an outrageously hot 93 degrees in the Pacific Northwest. What's with all the hot temperatures? It's mad, isn't it? Anne McCallum says, hello, Anthony. Hello, Aaron, by the way. Hello, Anthony and the mighty Tua. Brilliant, much needed article on the destruction of prehistoric monuments. Uh, yes, um, I, I have to admit to being a little bit slow to getting it done, but uh, uh, with a little bit of prompting from Margaret uh, and, and uh, uh, kick up the backside. Um it's actually been one of my most read blog posts of all time. So um, it perhaps worth devoting an episode to uh, in the in the soon uh, coming uh, time. Barbara Murphy says, attics are wonderful places. Yes. Yes, all the spiders say. Tess McKinney says, hello from Kansas. Fulcher. Eva Anderson says, hello. And uh, so, well, says, good evening, everybody. Good to see you all. I've been looking forward to this for a week. I've been looking forward to it too. Gillian Gogarty's watching. Hello, Gillian. Falls you. Seamus Cunahan says, Muffy. You just couldn't come on and just sit there quietly, Cunahan. Yeah, I had to say something silly. Back of the class. <laughs> Hello, Seamus. How are you? Darina McCanny says, uh, Hi, Anthony, and the lovely Tua. Sorry. Hi, Anthony on the tour. Lovely to hear you guys. Good evening, Darina. Uh, okay. Lots of people talking to each other, which is brilliant. Edina Sparks is in New Mexico where it's rainy and says, good afternoon. Falcha, welcome along, Edina. Rex Fortenbury says, Jigrich uh, o Louisiana. Alligator August Galer. 
Ooh, well, I'll tell you what, we don't have alligators in Ireland. Not of, not of the reptilian kind, anyway. We have the human kind. Hello, Rex. Theresa McGuinness says, yes, Jax is Jacksonville. Ah, good stuff. David Brennan is in Louisiana in the USA. Fall to David. Welcome along. Good to see you. Kelly Jensen is in Boulder in Colorado. Fall to Kelly, uh, and welcome to you. Patrick Ruddy says, hello all from a rainy Glasgow. Don't worry, we know that it's going to clear soon. It's cleared uh, It's cleared Ireland and it, it's gone across the sea and then it'll be gone after a while. Lorraine McGrath says, hello from Vancouver in British Columbia in Canada. Fulgin, good evening to you, Lorraine. Welcome along to Live Irish Mits. Roisin Neovrenon says, good evening. Good evening, Roisin Fulgin. Sally Siggins says, evening from Sligo. Hello, Sally. Welcome along. Good to have Schligach on Schligach in, in the house. Melanie Lynn is here. Hello, all. Heat advisory, advisory in Connecticut today. Ponies in stalls with fans on. Yes, it seems to be hot in some places, all right. A warm one in BC, says Lorraine. Janet Moran says, hello, Anthony. And the two are from Triple H, Boston. Fall to Janet. Welcome along. Barb Jordan says, hi, all. Glad to be here. Gia Gutsch, Barbara. Barb, should I say. Jonathan Joseph Grant says, hello from London. Hello, Jonathan. And all our best from uh, the Boyne Valley to all the Londoners. Uh, Debbie MacDonald is in Oklahoma and says, hello, Folge. Kathy Millette says, hello, Anthony, from a warm Chicago. Seems to be a theme in the States today. Good evening, Kathy. Yvonne Prahl says, howdy from Wyoming. Hello, Yvonne. Thank you for joining us from Wyoming. Kat Hanley says, hello from Myrtle Beach, Falcha Cat. Sean Curtis is in Massachusetts. I got roots deep in Clare. Well, they can't be that deep because Clare is mostly limestone. A terrible joke. I'm sorry. You're very welcome along, Sean. I hope you enjoy the humor as well as the myths. Charlene McLean Cosby says, hi. Was on YouTube and saw you were on. Yay. Brilliant stuff, Charlene. Great. And welcome. Jacinta Paisley is along. Says, hi, Anthony and all the two of Folger. Welcome back, Jacinta. Great to see you again. Okay, I think we're up to date. Wow. Well, eventually. Marie Cronin is on YouTube. Says, hello, great to be here. Great to have you along, Marie Folger. Deborah Williams, uh, I think I read out already. Sean Taylor says, hello there, Folger, Sean. Uh, good. Uh, Arvon Gaunt. Says cheers all Folge. Marlon O'Hirmach says Jiv Ta Sulagum Kowil Shiv Guma. Well, uh, I'm in good form camp. It seems everybody is, apart from those who are in really, really warm temperatures, who might be suffering a little bit with the heat. Anyway, before we get started today, what are we on? 12:30. Before we get started today, I have to tell you the good news. And uh, Paul Nethercott, uh, one of the reasons that I haven't I've been a little bit lax with my correspondence is that I've been frantically, well, not Frantically, I've been carefully completing uh, the proofreading and the editing and the design of Island of the Setting Sun 2020. The good news, folks, is that tomorrow morning, the publisher will press that big green button in the center of his desk, the one that says send to print. Exciting times. I just have to give one more scan of the text because, you know, when you get when you proofread something and you make corrections, and somebody makes the corrections. It's a very important that they send it back to you and you read it again and you make sure that in making the corrections, they haven't introduced mistakes or interrupted text flow, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Cross headings get moved around and, you know, text that was at the top of a page is suddenly in the middle of a page and text that was at the bottom of a page moves to the next page. So I just have to give it one more check. And tonight uh, will be the night. And then tomorrow morning, all going well, uh, the Liffey Press will send the files. The book's been printed in England this time. All of my previous books with Liffey Press were published uh, in Spain, were printed in Spain. Uh, this one has been printed in England. We're hoping that will mean a slightly reduced turnaround time. I'm hoping to have copies in about three to four weeks' time. Uh, and don't forget, absolutely don't forget, please, to pre-order your signed copy on the Mythical Ireland website now. I'm going to paste that link in here uh, on YouTube and also on the video here on um, Facebook. 
as a comment. So you should see it as a comment uh, beneath the live video here. And uh, Margaret Ring, I know, shares the video onto the community. Perhaps, uh, Margaret, you might also share the link onto the community page, uh, and that would be great. The only other thing I want to say is thank you to all of the Mythical Ireland patrons, the new patrons, and, of course, the ones who've supported us for a while it's very nice to have your support. If you want to become a patron of Mythical Ireland, all you have to do is pop over to patreon.com forward slash Mythical Ireland. Mythical Ireland. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash Mythical Ireland. And the idea is that you, 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 you become a patron, you spend a little bit of money per month uh, supporting Mythical Ireland, but you get rewards. Uh, and uh, the, the patrons are always the first to see the best of the videos and the photography and the blog posts, etc. Uh, if you saw the one, uh, one of the very recent blog posts, um, the one about the myths about inbreeding uh, was published for patrons first um, and is now publicly available. That's not the only one. There's plenty more. Anyway, I just wanted to especially mention uh, in that regard uh, the following uh, patrons. Uh, Fiona Nagula Chiara, uh, Timothy E. Quinn, Donald E. Gavin, Erica Rivertree, Lee Williams, Donna Firer, and Marlon O'Hirmac, thank you all very much for your support. Pat Rowan has just joined us and is in the house. Fulcher, Pat, you're very, very welcome along to Live Irish Myths. Yes, Edina is talking about her time working for a publication printer for many years. Uh, did my time as a proofreader also. It's tedious work, Adina, isn't it? But it's very important uh, and fingers crossed. I actually found a mistake in the second edition. Uh, a, a repeat of that, of that, you know, repeat it twice. It's the sort of stuff that even if you read it a dozen times and another person reads it six times and another person reads it five times, just sometimes still stuff gets through. Anyway, thank you very much for joining us tonight. We are back talking about Poimbo Frick. And I told you last week that I had... Um, Don Hilton is in the house and says, love from Lancashire in the UK. Fall to Don. Great to see you. Uh, Pat Rowan, keeper between the ditches, is what Kristen Gray Taggart is saying. Yes, indeed. Drive safely. Um, uh, Tongbo Freyk. Um, the cattle raid of Freyk. Uh, I, I did say that I had only been introduced to recently. And I found it to be an enthralling and fascinatingly gripping story with so many fine details that linked it with other myths and, and which made it, in my view, a very, very special story. Uh, I think I was saying last week, there are 14 of these time bows, these cattle raid stories. A uh, great many of them are what are called REM scale or four stories. F-O-R-E, four stories, small stories, uh, or shorter stories that would be told in advance of the great epic Toynbo Cunha, the Cattle Raid of Cooley. Uh, this one uh, connects with Bruna Bonia, it connects with Rath Crohan, it connects with Maeve and Eilil, it connects with Boan, it connects with a, a deity called Bay Finn, who I don't know, could be... Um, uh, Etain, who is referred to in Tuchmark Etain by Midger as Bay Find, which literally means a uh, bright woman, uh, which I think is fantastic. Um, and of course, there's the cattle, uh, which are an important part of the story. Last week we read part one, this week we're going to read part two. Part two is a little bit shorter, so what I intended to do is I'm going to read a little bit from the introduction uh, to uh, uh, the uh, Wolfgang made. Uh, uh, it's not a translation, actually. It's a little book that was published uh, by the uh, Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies. Uh, I'm just going to get you the date for that now. P first published in 1967, revised in 74, and this is a reprint from 1994. Uh, the text is actually entirely printed, Oscailga, uh, in Irish, and there is no English translation in this, but there are copious notes and there's a good introduction. So I'm going to read a little bit of an introduction uh, as an, uh, perhaps a slightly alternative way of introducing us to the story. Then I'm going to read part two, 
uh, following which I'm going to read a little bit from the Dinshanicus, which may be relevant to the whole thing. Martin Donnie's in the house. Jigley Chantanagas, Togalair, caught up on 107 at the weekend. Looking forward to tonight. Brilliant stuff, Martin. You're fully caught up then. Uh, that's great. Thornbow Freyach has lately been the subject of a certain amount of scholarly discussion. Remember, this is written in the 60s. Uh, actually, um, yes. Uh, in Professor J. Kearney's Original and Stimulating Studies in Irish Literature and History, Dublin, 1955, in which the author sets out to prove that Toynbo Freich is a literary composition of the late 7th or early 8th century modelled on a certain incident in the primitive life of St. Kentigern, K-E-N-T-I-G-E-R-N, with additions from other, other literary sources, mainly, mainly hagiographical, in other words, relating to the lives of saints. Rowan Grove is in the house. So is Karen Gogus, and also Elaine Hanrahan is watching. Folge. Hello and good evening to all of you. Carey's thesis has not met with general approval. K. Jackson, in investigating the sources for the life of St. Kentigern, has demonstrated the unlikeliness of there having been a primitive 7th century vita of the saint from which Toynbo Freyach could have been adapted. According to Jackson, the motif of the ring of Polycrates occurring in Jocelyn's 12th century vita sancti Kentigerni and in Toynbo Freyach, and of course this is the, the motif of the ring that is a sign of uh, Freyach's love for Findavar, uh, which uh, Eileel throws into the river, but is caught quite magically by the salmon uh, and later brought uh, into the royal court uh, on top of the salmon. And in Thornbo Freyach goes back to a common source, an oral story known in Ireland and later also in Gaelicised Strathclyde. G. Murphy, in his review of Carney's book, has further strengthened, strengthened the case for an oral origin for Toynbo Freyach, should we really be surprised that there's an oral origin for many of these stories. He draws attention to the fact that the late Middle Irish versification of the Freyach story, edited by Carney and believed by him to be based on a manuscript of the prose story older and better than the archetype of the extant manuscripts of the tale, differs in many significant details from the prose version, sometimes agreeing with the Scottish ballad in the book of the Dean of Lismore, sometimes also with the late Middle Irish adaptation of the Freyach story, Tuchmark Trevlene. These differences are taken by Murphy as evidence for the existence of an earlier version of Toynbo Freyach, which was less clumsily constructed did not contain the ring incident and was also free from monastic intrusions. Watch out for a very comprehensive blog post, which will be available to patrons first, um, coming very soon. Uh, uh, I've been promising to do this for a long time, uh, and I found a time uh, over the past month to do it. Not so much in the past week or two, uh, but I want to get it finished, and that is a blog post dealing with... Uh, the, the myths being written down in monasteries and the sort of incursions that happened or intrusions. I like that word because I've always said uh, that there were a, a, a scribal or, or, or a ecclesiastical incursions into the myths. He concludes by assuming that our Toynbo Freyach is a normal imperfect recording by a monastic scribe of a secular oral tale. Fabulous. And of course, as with all these things, how can we possibly tell? Yes, we can tell by the details in Toynbo Freyach when it was written down, because last week we said that there was detail given of the countries, uh, especially Britain and the northern part of France, etc. Uh, uh, and, and the way they were described, they can narrow down that moment in history when the story is written down. But because you can narrow down the moment when it was written down, does not mean, therefore, that you have identified the moment in which the story was first uh, compiled, first constructed. Uh, I don't mean to spend too long on the academic. There is quite a lengthy introduction here, and I ain't going to read it all, because I'm sure that you want to get back to the story, which is fair enough. It is not my intention to enter here into a full discussion of all the problems involved. Good. <laughs> the situation is particularly complex insofar as many arguments can be used either way, as Kearney's treatment of Tuchmark Trevlene and the ballad shows. 
As I hope to deal more fully with the subject elsewhere, I limit myself here to present a survey of the various forms of the Frech saga, its literary affinities and possible sources, together with a tentative re reconstruction of its origin and development. And we're not, we're not going to go into those details. Okay, I think we'll just skip now to the story, part two of the story. Hope everybody is well. All of those who are in very, very hot states in the US, uh, hopefully you have your, um, couldn't think of the word, uh, the phrase air conditioning on, or you have your fan at the desk. Lots of people chatting back and forth, which is great. Fantastic. Lovely. So part two. Uh -huh. Yes. So last week we finished. Um, yeah, I'll read the last paragraph of part one so that we can have a sort of a seamless... Uh, 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 a seamless jaunt into part two. The criticizing and the wondering at these stories begin in the household. I shall not throw my mind on another youth in Erin after thee, says Findavar. Bind thyself for that, say Eilil and Maeve, and come thou to us with thy cows to the spoil of the cows from Kulinga, which is basically the Toynbow Kulinga. And when you shall come with your cows from the east back, you shall wed here that night at once and Findavar. I shall do that thing, says Freyk. They are in it then until the morning. Freyk sets about himself with his suite. He then bids farewell to Eilil and Maeve. They depart to their own territories then. And I think, didn't I say last week, it doesn't say what happens to Findavar, presumably at this moment in time, she's staying with uh, Eilil and Maeve. I have to get the glasses on because the text is quite small. Kelly Minich is watching. Hello, Kelly. You're very welcome along. On to Freyk. It hath chanced, and excuse the archaic English again, this is a, a late, I think this is a late 19th century translation. Unto Freach it hath chanced, as he roved from his lands, that his cattle were stolen by wandering bands. Uh, and remember that this is reconstructed in such a way that the English uh, telling of it rhymes. And remember that's quite impossible uh, because the old uh, Irish poetic version of it would have rhymed. I think wasn't it uh, composed as prose but it's very very poetic in, uh, in, in its construction. And there met him his mother and cried on thy way thou hast tarried and hard for thy slackness shalt pay. In the Alps of the south the wild mountains amid have thy children thy wife and thy cattle been hid. And a three of thy kine have the Picts carried forth, and in Alba they pasture, but far to the north. Now, alack, answered Freyk, what is best to be done? Rest at home, said his mother, nor seek them, my son. For to thee neither cattle nor children nor wife can avail if in seeking thou losest thy life. Can avail if in seeking, sorry, and though cattle be lacking, uh, the task shall be mine to replace what is lost and to grant thee the kind. This is almost like I'm reading out an English fairy tale, isn't it? But anyway, uh, there's a contrivance here, as I said, because there's no way that the translation uh, in, in making it rhyme can 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 uh, equal the uh, the Irish. So, nay, not so, answered Freyk. But my soul, I am sworn that when cattle from Cúlnga by force shall be shall be torn to King Alil and Maeve on my faith as their guest, I must ride with those cattle for war to the west. Wait, his wife. Yeah. So Aaron, uh, Megan is pointing out something here. Mm, interesting. Seems they're married already. Yeah, I know. No, but vainly she said, is this toil on thee cast? Thou shalt lose what thou seekest. And from him she passed. 
Three times nine of his men, there's that number again, three times nine, 27. Three times nine of his men for that foray were chosen and marched by his side. And a hawk flew before, and for hunting was a hound with a hunting leash tied. Very interesting. Again, the animals. Don't forget the hawk is a very important creature. Uh, um, Fenton MacBorkra uh, tran transforming into a, a salmon and then a hawk to escape the great flood. To Ben Barchi they went, for the border of Ulster their faces were set. And there of its marches the warder, the conquering cunnel they met. Freck hailed him, the conquering Cunnel, and told him the tale of his spoil. "'Tis ill luck that awaits thee,' said Cunnel. "'Thy quest shall be followed with toil." I'm just going to close that window because somebody's hammering nails. "'Twill be long ere the goal thou art reaching, though thy heart in the seeking may be. Colonel Kernock, here thou my beseeching, said Freyak, let thine aid be to me. I had hoped for this meeting with Colonel that his aid in the quest might be lent. I will go with thee truly, said Colonel, with Freyak and his comrades he went. Three times nine, Freyak and Colonel before them, over ocean from Ireland have passed. Through the land of North Saxony bore them. And the South Sea, they sighted at last. So again, here's the description of the countries from which they're able to roughly, approximately date the compilation of the story by the scribes. And again on the sea billows speeding, they went south over Ichthian foam. They marched on southward, still was their heading to the land where the long beards have home. But when Lombardy's hounds they were nearing, Sorry, bounds, not hounds. <laughs> to the land where the long beards have home. Sorry, but when Lombardy's bounds they were nearing, they made stand for above and around. Were the high peaks of Alba appearing, and the goal that they sought had been found. Helen is in the house. Is this uh, H or H? Oh, I do apologize. Your Majesty, I humbly prostrate myself before your greatness. Extra long bow for my uh, tardiness in recognising your presence, Your Majesty, Your Royal Highness. Please do feel free to occupy the greatest throne in the palace. I was going to say, wait or fetch her a drink. <laughs> I'm sure that's a good idea. <laughs> uh, joke. Terrible joke. Uh, where was I? <laughs> I can't find my place now. On the Alps... Uh, was a woman seen straying and herding the flocks of the sheep. Let our warriors behind be delaying, said Cunnel, and south let us keep. Twere well we should speak with yon woman, perchance she hath wisdom to teach. And with Cunnel went Freyk at that council. They neared her and held with her speech. Whence have come you, she said. Out of Ireland we are answered Cunnel, ill luck shall for Irishmen be. In this country, she cried, yet thy help I would win. From thy land was my mother, thou art to me kin. She basically tells them her mother's from Ireland. Of this land we know naught, nor where next we should turn, answered Cunnel, its nature from thee we would learn. "'Tis a grim land. I did nearly fall out of the chair. <laughs> "'Tis a grim land and hateful,' the woman replied. "'And the warriors are restless who forth from it ride. "'For full open, sorry, for full often of captives, of women and herd, "'of fair kine by them taken is brought to me word.'" Catherine Woodruff is in the house and says hello all. Fáilte Jigic, Catherine. Curtsy to Helen. Helen, I tell you what. Uh, you wouldn't get this in the office. Canst thou say what latest spoil, said Freyk, they won? Aye, she said, they harried Freyk of Idath son. Excuse me. He in Erin dwelleth near the western sea. Kine from him they carried, in other words, cattle. Wife and children, three. Here his wife abideth. 
where there where dwells the king. Turn and see his cattle yonder pasturing. Um, Lombardy, uh, or Lom Lombardy is part of, is is in northern France, isn't it? Am I mistaken? The, you know this long beards Lombardy. I think I think it is anyway. It could be mistaken. Out spoke Colonel Kernock. Aid us thou, he cried. Strength I lack, she answered. I can only guide. Sorry, it's it's Italy, not France, is it? Yes. Hang on a second. Where did I read about it though? Uh, uh, about the um, the connection. Uh, yeah, Lombardy's in Italy, not in. Um, some for some reason I had it in my head that Lombardy was a wine growing region of France, but then every region of France is wine growing in my head. Yeah, uh, Lombardy is in Italy, and of course, don't forget that they were uh, taken to the Alps. Uh, so we are dealing with uh, you know a, a good long journey into the heart of Europe. Sorry, but sorry about my momentary lap, lapse of concentration there. Here is Freyk, said Connell, yon his stolen cows. Freyk, she asked him, tell me, canst thou trust thy spouse? Why, said Freyk, though trusty, doubtless when she went, now since here she bideth, truth may well be spent. See ye now, yon woman, said she, with your herd, tell to her your errand, let her hear your word. Trust in her, an Irish sprung ye may well have, ye, ye, ye well may place. More, if you would ask me, Ulster reared her race. To that woman they went, nor their names from her hid, and they greeted her, welcome in kindness she bid. Don't worry, there is actually a, a prose version of this, but because the second part is so short, I said I'd read both. Uh, the, the poetic version, it has to be said, being translated into English is a little bit tedious because they're just trying to uh, break up sentences to make words uh, rhyme, and it's a little bit frustrating. What hath moved you, she said, from your country to go? On this journey, said Connell, our guide hath been woe. All the cattle that feed in these pastures are ours. And from us went the lady that's kept in yon towers. Tis ill luck, said the woman, that waits on your way. All the men of this hold doth that lady obey. You shall find amid dangers, your danger most great, in the serpent who guardeth the lists at the gate. Uh, so not only... Uh, uh, are, are all his possessions uh, in in a tower? Uh, the tower is guarded by a serpent. Isn't this wonderfully? Uh, this is this is the stuff straight out of European fairy tale, isn't it? For that lady said Freyach, she is none of my, she is none of my, she is fickle. No trust from me yet did she win, but on thee we rely. Thou art trusty, we know. Never yet to an Ulster man Ulster was foe. Is it men out of Ulster, she said, I have met? And is Connell, said Freyach, thus unknown to you yet? Kirsten Salisbury's in the house. Hello, Kirsten, welcome along. Of all heroes from Ulster, the battle who faced, Connell Kernock is foremost. His neck she embraced. And she cried with her arms around Connell, of old, of the conquering Connell our prophets have told. And tis ruin and doom to this hold that you bring, for that Connell shall sack it, all prophecies sing. Hear my read, she told them, when at fall of day, come the kine for milking, I abroad will stay. I the castle portal every eve should close. Ye shall find it opened free for tread of foes. Basically, she's going to leave the gate open for them. Kindly woman whose uh, 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 parentage is Irish uh, and who has uh, an affinity with the Ulstermen. I will say the weakling calves a while I keep. Tis for milk, I'll tell them. Come then while they sleep. Come their castle enter, all its wealth to spoil. Only rests that serpent he our plans may foil. Him it rests to vanquish. He will try you most. Surely from that serpent swarms a serpent host. 
Trust us well, answered Connell. That raid will we do. Typical brave old strands, no stopping them. And for castle they sought, and the snake at them flew. For it darted on Connell and twined round his waist. Yet the whole of that castle they plundered in haste. I'm thinking here very much of the constellation Ophiuchus, the serpent bearer, with the serpent twined around his waist, and he's grappling with it, the great hero that he is. And there's a constellation, two constellations, either side of Ophiuchus, serpent's caput and serpent's cauda, which basically means the head of the snake and the tail of the snake. The rest, the body being wrapped around Ophiuchus. And the woman was freed, and her sons with her three, and away from her prison she went with them free. And of all of the jewels amassed in that dun, the most costly and beauteous the conquerors won. Rescuing, bravely rescuing the, the, the princess. Doesn't this just sound like something out of... Uh, Shrek. <laughs> Kathy May Dayo says, good evening, Mr. Anthony and all the tour. Hope to find you all well. Missed you all. Really hot day here in Newcastle, Washington State, USA. Welcome along, Kathy May. We missed you and we're very, very glad to have you along. Aaron says, never heard of that constellation. Uh, interestingly about Ophiuchus, Ophiuchus stands kind of in opposition to Orion in that if you look at where the sun crosses the Milky Way above Orion, okay, that's between Taurus and Gemini. That's the summer solstice position, position right now today. If you look at the winter solstice position, position I haven't had a drop to drink. <laughs> when you look at the winter solstice position, in the Milky Way, it is located between the constellations of uh, Sagittarius and Scorpius, Scorpius the Scorpion. But uh, just above them, and in fact, uh, just beneath the constellation of Eusius, you can imagine that his foot is standing in the river of the Milky Way. And I always thought it was very interesting that here are these two constellations that represent, on the one hand, the warrior, the, the hero, the hunter, a sort of a deity who not only carries the sun across the sky, but who also stands in ford water like Cuchulain did uh, and um, is holding his shield up and is getting ready to battle with the fierce bull. And on the other side of the uh, uh, zodiac, you have this sort of little bit of an extra uh, zodiac constellation in that there's a tiny portion of Ophiuchus through which the sun passes around the time of winter, winter solstice, which I think is fascinating. If you look at uh, download Stellarium, which is free uh, software uh, for the computer, uh, and just have a look at um, the constellation artwork, show the constellation map, the lines and all the rest, and show the artwork. And it's really interesting where the, the sun crosses the Milky Way. In both cases, there are these giant hero, warrior, god, deity types. One of them is battling or getting ready to battle with a great bull. And of course, one wonder, wonders whether that inspired the great proliferation of bull mythology in early Ireland. And then on the other side, you have the uh, the hero grappling with, uh, the, uh, with the serpent. Who, who else in classical mythology grappled with a serpent? I know uh, Hercules uh, uh, cut the head off the hydra um is Asclapius, is it uh i can't something i don't want to do a google search now i think i've interrupted the story enough then the serpent from connell was loosed from his belt which is very interesting it crept safely no harm from that serpent he felt in other words the serpent didn't bite him and they traveled back north to the pictish domains and a three of their cattle they found on the plains. And where Ola my Bruin his hold had of yore, by Donali their cattle they drove to the shore. It chanced at Ard Oan Echach, where foam is hurled on high, that doom on Bichna falling, his death he came to die. Twas while the cows were driven that Bichna's life was lost by trampling hooves of cattle crushed down to death or tossed. So basically the whole story is over in a flash. Uh, this is the curious thing about this, and one wonders whether 
uh, we're missing a portion of the story here uh, and that the original oral version of course would have dramatized uh, the meeting of the uh, of the with the serpent but it's all over in the space of a couple of lines it's basically all over uh, that the serpent was loosed from Connell and fled without uh, biting him Perseus and the Gorgon says Rex yes absolutely thank you for that to him was Lera father and Connell Kernock chief and Inver Bickna's title still marks his comrade's grief. Across the stream of Bickna, the, the cows of Freyach have passed, and near they came to Benkor, and there their horns are cast. Tis thence the strand of Bangor, for I it is named Tis said, the strand of horns men call it, those horns his cattle shed, which is fascinating because, again, any reference to cattle dropping their bits into places that are named after that is suggestive of this very, very ancient uh, prehistoric, uh, uh, pre probably pre-writing pre uh, uh, Indo-European creation myth involving the slaying of a great beast and its, its bits forming various landscape features. To his home travelled travelled Freyach with his children and his cattle and there with them lived out his life till the summons of Eilil and Maeve he obeyed and when Cúlnia was harried he rode on the raid and there ends the po 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 poem uh, the rhyming, uh, the metrical version so I'm going to read uh, the, uh, the, uh, the prose version and again it is uh, quite short so in comparison to the first half of the story it is a lot more condensed because I only read the prose version of the first part last week. If if I had tried to read the poem version, we would have needed probably three, maybe four episodes in total. Who is not well? Somebody's not well. Somebody's caught saying, I hope he gets well. Apollo slays the python. Oh, I apologize. Didn't mean to do that. Can you spell those constellations? Ophiuchus is O P H I U C H U S. O P H I U C H U S. And Serpens is S E R P E N S. Serpens Cauda. C A U D A and Serpens Caput, uh, K C A P U T, your cap, you know, your head. I, I can't find somebody has somebody is not well, and I just wanted to wish to wish uh, whoever it is a speedy recovery. Oh, sorry, here it is. Nora's dad is not well, hence her absence. We may wish her dad a speedy recovery. Yes, indeed, Nora. Uh, all the very best wishes to your dad uh, for a speedy uh, uh, recovery and get well soon. From all of us, grow more. We're all thinking about you. So here's the literal translation, as it's called. It happened that his cows had been, in the meanwhile, stolen. This is Freyach. His mother came to him, not active or lucky, of journey hast thou gone. It shall cause much of trouble to you, she says. The cows have been stolen and your three sons and your wife so that they are in the mountains of El Elpa, which presumably is the Alps. Well, it is the Alps. Three cows of them are in Alba to the north with the Kruthneki, the Picts. <laughs> Excuse me. Query, what shall I do, he says to his mother? Thou shalt do a non-going for seeking them. Thou wouldst not give thy life for them, she says. In other words, here we have the stark warning that if you go after your cattle, it's going to be gravely danger, dangerous for it's going to cost you your life. You will have cows at my hands besides them. Not so this, he says. I have pledged my hospitality and my soul to go to Alil and Maeve with my cows to the spoil from the cows from Kulnia. What thou seekest shall not be obtained, says his mother. At this, she goes off from him then. Uh, so this is fascinating. Uh, he had uh, given his word to Findavar, uh, and uh, now suddenly in the second part of the st story, he's married. Uh, 
He then sets out with three nines and a wild cuckoo, in brackets, a hawk, and a hound of tie with them, T-I-E, and a hound of tie with them, until he goes to the territory of the Ulsterman so that he meets with Colonel Kernock, Colonel the Victorious, at Benna Barky, a mountain on the Ulster border. Yeah, it's a funny turn of phrase, Aaron, isn't it? Thou shalt do a non-going. In other words, the mother's basically saying to him, you're not going anywhere. Get that idea out of your head. You're staying right here, boyo. He tells his quest to them. What awaits thee, says the latter, shalt not be lucky for thee. Much of trouble awaits thee, he says, though in it the mind should be. It will come to me, says Freck to Connell, that thou wouldst help me any time we should meet. I shall go truly, says Connell Kernock. They set out of the three, i.e. the three nines, uh, over sea, over Saxony of the north, over the Sea of Icht, the sea between England and France, to the north of the Lombards, the dwellers of Lombardy, until they reached the mountains of Elpa. They saw a herd girl at tending of the sheep before them. Let us go south, says Connell. O Freyk, that we may address the woman yonder and let our youths stay there. They went then to a conversation. She said, whence are ye? Of the men of Aaron, says Connell. It shall not be lucky for the men of Aaron, truly, the coming to this country. From the men of Aaron, too, is my mother. Aid thou me on account of relationship. Tell us something about our movements. What is the quality of land we have come to? A grim, hateful land with troublesome warriors who go on every side for carrying off cows and women as captives, she says. What is the latest thing they have carried off, says Freyk? The cows of Freyk, son of Idath, from the west of Aaron, and his wife and his three sons. Stephen McHugh says hello to all. Falsha, Stephen. The cows of Frech, oh sorry, here is his wife here in the house of the king. Here are his cows in the country in front of you. Let thy aid come to us, says Connell. Little is my power, save guidance only. This is Frech, says Connell, and there is his cows that have been carried off. Is the woman constant in your estimation, she says. Though constant in our estimation when she went, perchance she is not constant after coming. The woman who frequents the cows, go ye to her, tell ye of her errand, of the men of Ireland, her race, of the men of Ulster, exactly. Hello, Margaret Kiernan, welcome along. They come to her, they receive her, and they name themselves to her, and she bids welcome to them. What hath led you forth, she says. Trouble hath led us forth, says Connell. Ours are the cows and the woman that is in the lis. Of course, lis, I was saying, is lish, is an old Irish uh, word for a fort, usually a ring fort. In this case, I think it's a sort of a castle. It shall not be lucky for you, truly, she says. The going up to the multitude of the woman. More troublesome to you than everything, she says is the serpent which is at the guarding of the list. She is not my country name, says Freyk. She is not constant in my estimation. Thou art constant, constant in my estimation. We know thou wilt not lead us astray, since it is from the men of Ulster thou art. Whence are ye from the men of Ulster, she says, this is Connell Kernock here, the bravest hero with the men of Ulster, says Freyk. She flings two hands around the throat of Connell Kernock. Now, this is a loving embrace. She's not trying to choke him. <laughs> the, destruction, the destruction has come in this expedition, she says, since he has come to us, for it is to him the destruction of this dun has been prophesied. I shall go out to my house, she says. I shall not be at the milking of the cows. I shall leave the list opened. It is I who close it every night. Jules Cousins is in the house. Fall to Jules. 
I shall say it is for drink the calves were sucking. Come thou into the dun, when they are sleeping, only trouble. Some to you is the serpent, which is at the dun. Several tribes are let loose from it. Don't know what that means. We will go truly, says Connell. They attack the list. The serpent darts leap into the girdle of Connell Kernock, and they plunder the dun at once. They save off then the woman and the three sons, and they carry away whatever was the best of the gems of the dun. And Connell lets the serpent out of his girdle, and neither of them did harm to the other. And and, and just a moment ago, uh, she was saying that the greatest trouble you're going to have is, is with the serpent. And in a moment, the whole thing is over. It's very disappointing. Uh, th this is akin to a, 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 a medieval a, um, a medieval let letdown, you know, uh, a, a medieval anticlimax. And they came to the territory of the people of the Picts until they saw three cows of their cows in it. They drove, that's the rest of the cows that were stolen. They're still in the land of the Picts. They drove off to the fort of Olach Mac Bruin, now Donali near Oban or Ovan, with them until they were Ard Oan Echach, high foaming Echach, ECH, ACH. ECH is usually a horse. Uh, so I'm wondering whether that's the high foaming horses. It is there the gilly of Connell met his death at the driving of the cows. That is Bikna, son of Lera. It is from this is the name of Inver Bikna, the Bikna est estuary at Ben Cor. They brought their cows over it thither. It is there they flung their horns from them. So that it is <coughs> so that it is thence na the name of Tracht Ben Cor, the strand of horn casting perhaps the modern Bangor. Freck goes away then to his territory after, and his wife and his sons and his cows with him, until he goes with Alil and Maeve for the spoil of the cows from Cuilnia. And there you go. That is the end of the story of Toynbo Freck. A little bit disappointing because I thought that the first half of the story was actually far more exciting than the second. The Picts in Scotland, yes, indeed. That is the one and the same, the Picts. They picked their battle there. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'll stick to the reading, shall I? <laughs> and so the one other connection here, uh, how do I uh, sort of uh, describe this or elucidate it, um, is that there is a, f a, a further possible connection with this character Freyach in the Dunshemachus. I was just trying to find out where it referred to that. Um, <laughs> Karn Freyach. Uh, yes. Well, there's a place called Karn Freyach and I'm going to read the story of it from the metrical Dunshemachus. But I just wasn't entirely sure because I couldn't remember from last week what exactly the connection was. And anyway, I'll read it to you. And then we might be able to f figure out ourselves. Megan Walter says, yeah, it feels like something is missing. Well, I mean, if you're building up to this whole sort of, you know, your cattle are, were stolen and they were brought to the Alps and you have to go there. But it's going to and several people warn, you know, this is going to be your death. Um, and Connell Kernock and Freke decide, well, yeah, yeah, we're okay. We're 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 brave warriors and heroes. We've nothing we haven't seen in Ulster, you know. Let's go over there uh, and and follow the cattle to the Alps. And when they get to the Alps, they're told very specifically that the worst of all things uh, that awaits you is this great serpent that that guards the tower or the castle or the lists or the fort, whatever it happens to be. And in the space of four lines of poetry, in the state, in the space of the second half of one quatrain and the first half of the next, uh, the serpent wraps itself around Connell and then is loosed from Connell, and the whole thing is just over so quickly. It's lacking all the drama. It's, it's, it's like you're, it's like you're watching, uh, Peaky Blinders or uh, Game of Thrones or an episode or a couple of episodes of Sherlock Holmes, and. 
it's building up and building up and building up to this big finish. But when the big finish comes, what happens is that uh, it's cut out of the story and is summarised in a, in, a, in a brief few seconds of film. It's very, very disappointing. Uh, without being a scholar on the various manuscripts involved, uh, I would have to suppose and propose and guess we are in the realm of conjecture and speculation here. One would have to, Adele Perth is in the house and says, good morning, good day, mate. Falcha, Adele, and very good to have Australia in the house. One would have to speculate uh, that this is a story from which a significant chunk of the detail is missing, uh, you know, um, that it's like there's an episode missing. It's like the, the monk is writing it down, perhaps from another written source, and the written source is missing certain uh, leaves of vellum, uh, or several, uh, and and has to concoct the, the gap, as it were. Because to me, it would seem that the, the whole... Um, uh, the zenith, or the, 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 the climax uh, of the tale, of the second part of the story... Uh, should be one one imagines the confrontation with uh, the serpent, or it's like you know the battle with the dragon, but yet it's compressed, and they go, and the battle lasts a few lines of text, and suddenly they're heading back, and they're going to Scotland. It's bizarre. So this is Karn Freak, and this is from Gwyn's Metrical Dunshanicus. This is Volume Three, originally published. I'm going to guess 1913. Yes, 1913, and uh, this is one of these facsimile reprints, and it's a fac exact facsimile of the original, which is brilliant. So as, as I'm always saying with the metrical Dinshanicus, you have the Irish version of the story with the, uh, the quatrains on this side and the English translation on the other side of the page, and at the bottom then any notes. Uh, some pages have more notes than others. So this is Carn Freyach. Karn Frech, what is the reason of the name? Let it be asked of the learned. The Frech from whom the goodly Cairn is named, his weapon was not feeble in the fray. In other words, in the first uh, quatrain here, we're being told that he was very brave. I ask of you no petty matter, ye learned that dwell round the spot. What was the former name of the pointed Cairn? Dot 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 ellipsis, uh, and and there's no ellipsis on in the Irish. Bizarrely, what is happening here? Uh, Morgan Daimler will have something to say about this. Is that there's a line of Irish text here which the translator obviously couldn't translate and just left it blank. It seemed a bit obscure. Pardon me, I'm going to sneeze. <coughs> Definitely into the elbow. Wouldn't it be brilliant if the missing part was discovered? Yeah, I'll do more research on it. Uh, Megan Walter says, but that's an important bit of the plot in itself, if so. Unless he was a calming influence on the snake, says Philomena. Hmm. Where was Rath Crohan in this? Bernie wants to know. Rath Crohan was where... Uh, uh, Freyk went to with his company from Bruna Bonia at the beginning of the first part of the story. Uh, and Eileen and Maeve are, are based in, in Rathcrohan, so that's where uh, any, any time that they're being mentioned, that's where the action is taking place. I will name to you tis true lore without contention or wrangling the Freyk from whom the strong cairn is called in the plain yonder, excellent in might. Knoch Nadala was its name aforetime. In the days of Maeve, great and glorious, it endured to old age thereafter, with every man that dwelt, dwelt there past counting. Though many names belonged to the hill in succession, until the coming of Con, who provoked envy, they all departed from it, and likewise every man to whom the hill beyond. Emer Galvin says... Good evening, all. Can't be there tonight. We'll catch up later. Just wanted to say hello. Have a wonderful evening. Thanks, Emer. And you too. Have a great one. 
The foster father of great Con Macphailan was Connell of Terrast Crochu. Though he dwelt in stone-built Crochu, he was king over the tribes of Chower. In other words, he may, he may have uh, dwelt in, in uh, Crochen, uh, but uh, he, he, uh, he, he, he was king at Tara. Four boys, and Tara, of course, is in County Meath on the east of the country. Four boys, the rampart of a household, had Connell in sloping Chower. They were reared in pointed Crochu and among the tribes of Eirir Umol, or o of Oval. Cork and Conla and gentle Ketgen and Freak, vigorous youth. They were a fence that was doughty in every battle, D-O-U-G-H-T-Y. The vigorous spirited quartet. There grew a war betwixt Con and Owen of the proud exploits. Aaron is divided, share and share, between the two lusty kids. Before each, uh, 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 what a surprise here. Yet again, we have Ireland being partitioned in mythology. And I, I, I've made reference to that, and I think I'll do, have to do an episode on it when I get a chance to do more research, uh, which is the partition. Let me take a note of that before I forget it. The partitioning of Ireland in mythology. I apologize for the brief interruption. The partitioning of Ireland in mythology. I mean, you have um, uh, Eremon and Eber of the Milesians when they arrive. They split the country north and south. Don't forget uh, Isle Namirin and the four provinces meeting at the fifth. Don't forget uh, the Fir Volog, uh, Slonia and his brothers Rory, etc., dividing the country into five portions. Don't forget that division, La, La Coin and La Moga, uh, the northern and the southern halves, halves of Ireland. So many references to uh, Ireland being split and partitioned into different territories and provinces. Before each defined his territory, there arose variance between them, and each harried the other's kind. In other words, the other's cattle. No hour was safe from raiding. And as we've said before, seems to have been a very significant thing, especially in medieval Ireland, cattle raids. Mighty Owen Tyluk came to Crochu of the Dun Ramparts, along with the captain of his stout, his stout household. And captain, by the way, is translated from the Irish word Tashuk, which is a, a, a variant of the word that we know as Tishak, which means the chief, and the chief of the tribe was the Tishak, and our Tishak is our prime minister. Along with the captain of his stout household, who severs the spear point from the shaft. The youth of Munster, and Munster, uh, of course, is the southern part of the country, long-haired, commit ravage in Crochu. Even Owen and Manly Freyach Two flaming lion-like heroes. Oh, Sean Fitzgerald is in the house. Con is a tall too, Sean. Uh, Roth. You're very, very welcome. Gra grab a chair and make yourself comfortable. Connell and his strong clan and the lusty kids of his horsemen overtook the spoilers of Crochu, field of wounds, with the dot, 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 ellipsis, Horses of the Warriors. Mm, yes, on, uh, uh, Gwyn has failed to translate that word. Freck, son of curly-haired Connell, wounded Owen, mild of nature. There was Owen robbed of his kind by reason of the forays of the noble clans. And here it is being suggested that Freck is the son of Connell. Uh, I presume that's uh, sorry I'm not paying attention doesn't say is that Colonel Kernock or is that a different Colonel the Colonel Kernock from the from from Tornbo Freyach it doesn't actually specify sorry Freyach lordly of nature the king of Spain's son famed for horses, then that's definitely not Colonel Kernock, defended his shield at the spear's point, 
by the might of his right hand as is fitting. Somebody's answering the question about cattle and silver and gold. Yeah, cattle were for a long, long time uh, a currency, you know, uh, uh, and they were transportable, but also the important thing is they were edible. The son of Connell, dealer of wounds, answered him. Freak of the even balanced nature. That's very interesting. What does that mean? Freak of the even balanced nature. The two Freaks from Europe's plains were the two champions of the strong and skillful chiefs. The armies sit down by their spears to behold the young warriors and to watch the pair of untried heroes contending in doughty deeds. This was the end of the fierce conflict. The son of Red Speared Connell is slain. There followed a slaughter of the monstermen of the plains. The spoils left by the nobles decked the victors. The children of Connell, sore wounded, part from each other in the battle, and it is a chilly reward, alas, to be without the great hero at Medria. They raise on the shafts of their spears the vigorous sons of great chieftains. They bear away from stone-built Krohu the salmon of the tribes of Chower. Wow. Mm. Wow. So this is uh, another another name. Uh, this is a poetic name, obviously, for, uh, for Freyach. So I presume it's Freyach that has died. Um, yeah, this is the end of the fierce conflict. The son of Red Speared Connell is slain. And there followed a slaughter of the monstermen. They raise on the shaft the children of Connell, who I presume the other brothers, sore wounded, because there were four, it mentioned four of them, sore wounded, part from each other in the battle, and it is a chilly reward, alas, to be without the great hero. They raise on the shaft of their spears the vigorous sons of great chieftains. They bear away from stone-built Krohu, the salmon of the tribes of Chower. Very interesting. Let him be laid in this cairn by my side, said Connell, the high-born chief. His name shall be on the fair cairn, cairn to designate it there among men of lore. I mean, just wondering about, yeah, I know I got lost with the two freaks as well, Megan. It just suddenly started talking about two freaks. But clearly there are connections with the freak of Toynbow Freak because uh, wasn't he the one uh, who, who, who brought the salmon? Uh, to uh, Eileel and Maeve, uh, the one that had caught the ring. And perhaps this is where the nickname the salmon comes from. Let him be laid in this cairn by my side, said Connell, the highborn chief. His name shall be on the fair, fair cairn to designate it there among men of lore. Carn Freak it is ever since from that Freak, whoever it be that inquires thereof. Even the son of Connell never hard about cattle. I praise its people joyously. Some tell another tale concerning Carn Freak of the princely house, how it was called from glorious Fidak's son, the stripling who crushed a mighty band. They have settled that the round cairn is named from Freak, buoyant of soul, excuse me, and that it was in the time of Maeve long since who stirred his spirit against the foemen. By the hand of Cuchulain, famed for goodly feats, the slender youth surely perished. In a river fight, though it be a reproach, he fell by the hand of the strong hound. And of course, Cuchulain nearly always kills his enemies in ford water, in river fords. By the edge of festive Schliav Fuat, in the even balanced Battle of Oman, was drowned the son of the champion Fidach, whose hand made no senseless havoc. After his drowning in the brimming stream, his head was severed and his war cry silenced. The army leaned on their spears while their great prince fought a fatal match. All that army made a pause round the head a while. 
they utter round the head a cry of mourning. It had been better for them to avenge it. Before Maeve quitted the field, she saw a strange sight drawing nigh. Women folk, sweet-voiced, famous long after, their beauty reflected in the stream's shining waters. The blooming women folk bear the body away with them to the peaceful, it says elf mount, but it's she, uh, away with them to the peaceful she. They utter wailing and vehement grief. Unbefitting was their general woe. She Freach is so christened by men from Fidak's son of the gilded spear. At his she, twas a goodly brood, befell the warrior's destruction. Tis right pitiful. In such wise came his death yonder of yore to Freach, son of Fidach, from all of the Toynbo Kulnya with its forays. Heavy the sorrow of it for his household. Yes, indeed. And there ends the story or the poem, uh, the metrical Denshanicus poem of Karn Freach. And there ends pretty much everything we have to say tonight about, I think, uh, unless there are questions. Freck, uh, is, is that any, somebody's wanting to f uh, to get his spelling. There are variants of his spellings, uh, or of his, uh, variant spellings of his name. F-R-A, I thought of C-H is one, and F-R-A-O-C-H is another. Uh, there's two that I'm just posting in, pasting in as comments. So um, you'll see in the Irish version of the tale, that's it there. I know this is going to be back to front for some of you. Toynbo Freck, F-R-A, I thought of C-H. And yet, um, you know, this is a really interesting thing about the language. The very first word in the story is Freck, spelled F-R-O-F-A-D-A, E-C-H, Freck, which is, you know, a different spelling uh, and, and also would be pronounced differently because the fada is on the O. Uh, anyway, Freak, I hope I have helped, helped you in some ways with the spellings. Um, yeah, so I really enjoyed that. I have to say when I read it, uh, I think I was telling you, uh, I was uh, scoring uh, my copy of the book with lots of pencil marks in the margins, which is always an indication uh, of, of uh, interesting things going on. I will come back to it, I think, not for Live Irish Myths, uh, but I will write more about it. I, I think I, I do think it's important. In the meantime, there are other uh, Toyn raids, uh, and look, there's plenty more to come. Uh, there's plenty more myth uh, to come in the future. Even though we're on episode 108, uh, there's always more to be explored. And uh, we're getting into the territory, too, where we're exploring myths that I am not familiar with and myths that are a little bit uh, more obscure and perhaps not widely available as translations. And that's all good. It's all good. Uh, there's so much in the Denshanicus. Sure, we could do another dozen episodes about the Denshanicus and more. And I hope you've all enjoyed yourself. We are on an hour and 17 minutes. I certainly have enjoyed myself. Um, I, I know that uh, we're down to one episode a week, which is Monday nights. Um, now that Island of the Setting Sun is going to print, um, I, I certainly would hope, uh, but I can't promise, uh, to be able to do a, a couple more of those unannounced, uh, uh, unplanned uh, live, live broadcasts, especially from out in the monuments. Uh, also, I need to get off the chair here and, and out of this uh, wonderful library uh, into the landscape uh, to some of the sites and get back seeing them again. Uh, I am actually giving a public talk uh, in the coming few weeks. I can't say any more right now, but watch out for details of that. Hopefully, uh, later this evening, I'll put a post on the Mythical Ireland page and the Mythical Ireland community about that um and that would if it happens that will be my first public talk since the last day of february uh, and of course it will be all planned uh, with physical distancing in mind uh, so there'll be no uh, issue of crowding people into a room or anything like that uh, everybody will be safe in the meantime please do all your best to stay safe 
uh, uh, to keep washing your hands and uh, uh, to uh, use hand sanitizer and to keep your physical distancing when you're outside. Theresa says, if thoughts of the tribe could be with my daughter, Maggie Galloway. She is quarantined at her home with COVID, waiting on her test results, coming out both ends at the moment. Okay, Theresa, we will uh, hold uh, Maggie in our thoughts and our very best regards to her. You'll need to get some Christmas myths ready soon, says Brendan. <laughs> uh, take it easy. We have Lunasa to come first, uh, so keep keep tuned. Um, glad you all enjoyed yourselves. Just remember, uh, when you're outside, stay apart. And also, you know, I know some people don't like it, but that's tough. Uh, you can do a lot to protect yourself and your loved ones by wearing a mask when you're in public. Uh, so thank you all for your lovely comments. Glad you enjoyed yourselves. And back next week, I haven't a clue what we'll be talking about, but sure, you know, there'll be something. And I am hope it'll be interesting. Uh, so... In the meantime, good night to everybody, and we'll see you next week. But hopefully, as I said, we'll see you in between. I'll do I'll do my very best to get out uh, into the landscape and do a couple of impromptu uh, live streams. I need the fresh air. Uh, it's a beautiful evening now after a very, very, very wet and dull morning. It eventually brightened up, and it's a beautiful, bright evening, although it's still a bit breezy. Uh, Comet Neowise hasn't disappeared but it is really now, unless you're a specialised comet hunter, like I, I've spent my whole life hunting comets, and I know that they are so capricious in nature. Comet Neowise is a binocular object and can be captured with a camera. I see Patricia McAteer has captured images in, the, in recent nights. Uh, I saw it briefly, captured it last night before the clouds rolled in. It is a lot fainter and smaller than it was a couple of weeks ago. But you, could see, you still have time to catch it. Grab a pair of binoculars and you'll probably see it uh, beneath the plough in Ursa Major. Anyway, thanks all. Good night. Ichawa Kolosov, August Slán Gafol. We'll see you all next week and hopefully sometime in between. Best wishes to you all. Good night. Bye-bye.